And the first, or the first voting example for really this term two has to do with how we might assess how good someone is at something. Yeah. How, ma how many of you have played a board game, such as chess, where you have been given some kind of ELO rating or something of the sort as to how good you are? Got a few. How many of you have played a video game? Maybe you had some sort of ranked or something like that where it tried to assess how good you are. Yeah, we got, some, we got a few more there. That's fine. And this one, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because this applies to everyone. When you're in high school, your GPA is supposed to be some sort of reflection of how smart you are. Now, the natural question is, how accurate are these? Let's say we got two students. One is a freshman in high school. They've only taken seven courses. That's it. Their GPA is a 4.0. You got another student who is finishing their senior year and they're graduating high school with a perfect 4.0. You might look at those two and say, oh, same thing. They're both the same intelligence. Well, we would naturally think that, sec oh, that second person is probably going to be smarter, not because their number is higher, but because they did it more consistently. And that kind of builds in on our general understanding that the larger of a sample size we have of something, the more likely it is to be closer to their true value. But is that 4.0 exactly how smart they are? There's still some uncertainty. What happens if that student just so happened to constantly get really easy instructors who just gave the whole class an A? You got some uncertainty there. What if you're playing these video games, you're doing ranked, and you constantly get stuck with teammates who have no idea what they're doing. They constantly lose. Yeah, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> they just constantly lose. You want to slap yourself in the face. Or you're playing a board game. Let's say it's, uh, I'm trying to think of a common, say three-player Carcassonne. I don't know if you, any of y'all know what Carcassonne is. And the other player is mad at you because you made a move that was smart in your case. They decide to spend the whole game screwing you over. These are some uncertain things that you don't know purely based off of the number you have, that estimator for how good this person is, and the sample size. No matter how big our sample size is, no matter where our estimate is, there's always going to be uncertainty. Now, on average, you might expect someone with a 4.0 at the end of their senior year to be smarter than someone with a 3.9. But there is a chance if you gave them both the same test, the 3.9 might do better. And that's because there's some uncertainty with that, not only in how correct this estimate is, but the actual test they had in question. To really illustrate that concept, the polls, previous presidential election, the polls, they were better this time. They weren't great, they were better. Y'all remember back in 2016, the polls of the Midwest were a complete and total disaster. They had Hillary Clinton up by seven points in Wisconsin. Everyone's like, oh. Even if there's a terrible polling error, she'll still win it. And then she lost it by less than a point. And that happened all across the Midwest. And the reason why was because there was a lot of uncertainty. And so the concepts I'm going to discuss to you in this lecture, along with as we get further along into confidence intervals and sample means, you'll hopefully get a better conceptual understanding of where these uncertainties in our estimators of skill come from and what you can do about them. So. Let's go ahead and begin. Here we have our first definitions. You see, I pre-typed them out. Should be very easy to read. Uh, if I zoom in, you won't see the right-hand side, but hopefully should be able to read that. Now, those examples I all gave, whether it's your ranked score in a video game, your ELO in a board game, or your GPA in real life, all of that is a sampling of everything you have done. And by that same logic, the polls, when they did the polls back in 20, well, this previous 2020 election, which were generally pretty good, and the ones in 2016, which were generally trash, they were supposed to be a random sample. In our formal definition of a random sample, we have some sample size n. It's the same n that you're used to from before. And our population is sufficiently large so that every element is independently from the same population. So I'll give you a second you to write that down. Let me pull this up. Now, I could just take people in the room and just randomly start picking y'all and that's it. That's just boring. Usually, no matter what type of poll you have or ELO you have or whatnot, it's going to be something more specific than that. And we have four types of it. The first one is the most common. I'm going to skip that for a moment. 
because that's the most common and the most important one. We'll go to the bottom one. The bottom one is the least common one. We call it judgment random sampling. All these RSs, they stand for random sampling. And in this case, you look at the people and you look at the ones that you think are going to be representative of the population as a whole, and you just pick one of them. So for example, let's say we went to the House of Representatives and we wanted to get a good idea for how they might vote on HR1, which is a voting rights bill. We might pull aside Steny Hoyer, who is the House Majority Leader for the Democrats, and Kevin McCarthy, who is the House Minority Leader for the Republicans, and ask them both their thoughts under the expectation that those two will be representative of the Democrats and the Republicans as a whole. The issue with judgment sampling is that typically your sample size is really small. And as I already discussed, like with the freshman student in high school, if you've got a really large sample size, you're gonna have a lot of uncertainty. Now, the next least common one, we call it convenience sampling. We just take the people who are most likely to respond or people who volunteer, that type of thing, and just see what they think. So for example, in those mid-semester evaluations, if I had just sent them out one email, that's it. That would have been convenience, but I didn't do that. I badgered the entire class until most of y'all filled it out. So that's no longer really any kind of sampling. That's just doing the whole population. You'll recall from unit one, that's called a census. But convenience random sampling, if that mid-semester evaluations, I just sent them out, said fill them out, and I didn't push you any further, that'd be convenience because the people who'd fill it out are the ones who just volunteer to do so. Likewise, at the end of the semester, when you fill out the, the university's evaluations, I'm pretty sure it's not going to have as high as a response rate as the other one did because extra credit is one hell of a motivator. But in that case, that, that'll be convenience sampling. Another one, when you're going through drive throughs you get your receipt. At the end of the receipt, it's like, please fill out this survey and tell us what you think. 95% of people who get that do not care. They just want their food. But there's the 5% who really like it or really didn't, they'll go on and fill it out. That's also convenience. Now, the second most common one is called systematic random sampling. So let's suppose we want our sample size to be 100 and we have 10,000 people to choose from. We might order them, order them whatever way you want, doesn't matter, pick the hundredth, I'm sorry, the 10th person, because 100 over 10,000, that's 10. And then every 100th person after that, and you'll go through and get that sample size. The difference between that and a random sample is the random sample. We could very well get the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh person. That's possible by random chance. The reason why, a really good example of where you get systematic random samplings with phone books or phone numbers. Because a lot of these phone numbers and phone books, everything's alphabetized. You want to get people across all the alphabet because everyone knows there's that one letter in the alphabet, starts with a P, where the people's last names have about 5 million letters. <laughs> so you do systematic, you catch everything. And it's, they, they did actually do some studies. You can look this up if you want. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, where there are some letters of last names or just some last names in general that are more common among Black people and then others that are more common among Indians, that's the P, and there's some that are more common around white people, particularly S. And so doing systematic random sampling with those phone books allows you to get around that. The most common one, this is the one you'll see the vast majority of the time, it's called stratified random sampling. What we do is we break our population into groups. We decide what those groups are. So for example, I might split y'all into men and women and then pick five from each. Or on the other hand, going back to that example of the House votes on HR1, we could split them into Democrats and Republicans and randomly pick 10 from each. That's stratified random sampling. The whole idea behind it is we split people into groups and then take a certain number of people randomly from each group. This is how the polls do it in the presidential elections. So for example, nationwide, it's roughly 70% white, I think like 12% black, 11% Hispanic, and the remainers are Asians, and Native Americans. So they'd split the respondents into white, Native American slash Asian. They're not the same thing, but they group them all together, uh, black and Hispanic. And then they'll say pick 700 white people randomly and say 120 black people randomly, so on and so forth. That is good. However, 
that only works if your assumptions about where you're picking these people from for the groups are accurate. The reason why the polls were screwed up in the Midwest back in 2016 was because they did not weigh white voters by education. Black college educated voters and black high school voters, they pretty much voted the exact same. Same with Hispanic, same with Asian. With white voters, the non-college educated white voters tended to vote far more Republican than the college educated white voters. And what was happening is when they were polling these voters, the college educated whites were far more likely to respond. And so in all these polls of the Midwest, which the Midwest is one of the whitest parts of the country, they were consistently missing a lot of Trump voters. That's why you had the polls so wrong in Wisconsin. Whereas this time around in 2020, they actually weighed it correctly by education. And that's why in Georgia, not only were the polls right for the presidential race, they were dead on for both of the Senate runoffs. And so the important takeaway there is that if used properly, and if you have the right assumptions, stratified will be the best. But the catch is, if your assumptions are wrong, your poll's going to be wrong no matter what. Your sample's going to be wrong no matter what. Going back to that GPA example, if we are assuming that the student at their senior year, if we're assuming their classes were across all the difficulty levels, you know, some easy, some hard, most in the middle, when in fact all they had were easy ones, you're going to get the wrong result no matter what. So before I continue, are there any questions about these types of sampling? All right, well, in this case, let's just go straight to an example so you can work on it while it's fresh in your mind. I believe it is right up here. Here we go. So here, you've got four different polls or samples. And what I want you to do is identify for each of these, which type of sampling method was used. You'll see this on the practice assessment. You're gonna see this on the assessment itself. So I'll give you about a minute or two to figure these out. Oh, sorry about that. All right, does anyone need more time? Okay, we will start with the first one. How many of y'all think that's convenient sampling? Judgment, stratified. Well, that's pretty much all the hands. That is correct. This one is stratified random sampling. And the, re yes, that is correct. <laughs> and the reason why, because we're splitting them into groups and then picking some from each. So this one, I'm just going to put stratified. A bit better, not perfect, but better than it used to be. Now I'll go with the second one. How many of y'all think that is convenience? We'll keep going, but that's most of the class. And judgment. Yeah, it's convenience. So here we'll write that down. I'm just going to put con and just leave it there. And the reason why, because we're picking, but these are basically the volunteers. The people who read their emails most often, the ones who are most likely to respond. Now, sometimes there's a bit of confusion between convenience and judgment. If we go back to our examples, the main difference between convenience and judgment is that with convenience, the person who's surveying, they don't pick the respondents, the respondents pick themselves. Whereas with judgment, the pollster or the person in question picks the people, not the other way around. 
So that said, our third one, how many of you all think this is systematic, stratified, convenience, judgment? This is systematic. And the, the dead giveaway for these ones is every time it says every 10th or 20th or 30th person after that. That's your dead giveaway. So in this case, this one will be, come on, there we go, systematic. I'm just going to put SYS. I don't have much space. So therefore, our last one's going to be judgment sampling. And in this one, the reason why is because, and this one here's the key phrase you're looking for for these ones is something along the lines of, they will be reflective or representative of the population as a whole. So this one will be judgment. All right, we'll go and move on to the next part. You're gonna see this pop up on the assessment. You'll see it on the practice assessment. So you better get familiar with this. So let's move on to our next part. So let me scroll just a little bit. Now, you don't need to write down the X bar and the S thing because you've seen those before. There's new one that's P bar. That's just the, the sample proportion. So for example, let's say I pulled all of you and I asked how many of y'all have an A in the class? And let's say seven out of 23 of you responded. Then, that, then the population or the sample proportion would be seven out of 23. You can convert that to decimal if you want. You'd round to three decimal places though. And that one is just the number of successes we have, whatever success is, divided by our sample size. Now, when we do this poll, say, say of Wisconsin, and it says Biden's up by five points, that is our sample mean and, or sample proportion, depending on which way you do it, let's just stick with sample proportion. And we are hoping that the sample proportion will be a good estimate for the actual proportion that'll vote for Biden. And so we say that P bar is a sample statistic that we use as a point estimator for our true P. The same holds for X bar, which is our sample mean, mu, which is our population mean, and then for S, our sample standard deviation, and sigma, our population standard deviation. For most of the remainder of this course, you're gonna be missing at least one of these. So for the problem in question, mu and sigma, you're almost certainly going to be missing at least one of them. And you're not going to be able to get it with complete certainty unless you know, you're given one of the population things already. Usually, what you'll see is you're going to have at least one of these three on the left, and you're going to have to get a pretty good estimate for the thing on the right. Now, the nice thing is, as we've already discussed, the larger our sample size, so the larger our value of n, the more likely our estimate's gonna be correct. And here's the reason why. Y'all recall on the last question, I asked y'all to rate how effective I was, scale of one to five. I think the class average was like somewhere around like upper three, lower four, something like that. Let's suppose I picked just five of you and I took your five numbers. It's theoretically possible all of those could be fives, even though that's quite a few decimal points away from the actual number. On the other hand, those could all be twos. That's even further away. But on the other hand, if I pick 50 of you, there is a way lower chance of that happening because in order for me to pick 50 of you and all and the whole average to be really far off, all of you would have to either really, really like me or really, really don't like me. And so the general idea behind it is the larger of a sample we have, the lower chance of we have of getting nothing but one of the extremes. Now you're gonna see this concept pop up. Here's an example. Let's suppose we have two poles of Texas. One of them, the sample size is 1,000 and 480 people are gonna vote for Biden. Let's say for the other one, 100 people are sampled and 51 are gonna vote for Biden. You should take the bigger sample size, so 480 out of 1,000, 48%. The other one was 51 out of 100, which was 51%. Now, the thing is, both of those two polls came from the same population. What happened was in the second one, because the sample size was so small, there's a chance they just hit more Democrats by pure chance. So in that sense, we would pick the poll with the larger sample size. So if you see any problem, whether it's on the practice assessment or the actual assessment, and you're given multiple polls, go with the one that has the biggest sample size. 
Now, it is entirely possible the smaller sample size might end up being better, but I would say nine times out of 10, the bigger sample size is gonna be the one that's more likely to be close to your correct estimate. And I'll show why that's the case in the next lecture, but for now, bigger sample size is better. Now, let's say we have this sample mean and we're using it as an estimator for our population mean. You might ask yourself, how confident are we that this is close to the mean? And what well, we will talk about in chapter eight, we will generate confidence intervals to get an estimate of the range where that mean will fall. But for now, before we can even build the intervals, we have to figure out how confident we wanna be. If we wanted to be 5% confident, we could just take that number and run with it. But you couldn't be that confident because it could be low or it could be higher, you have no idea. On the other hand, let's say that Texas poll, 48%. Let's say I said, okay, Biden's number will be between 46% and 48%. I can be more confident in that because my interval is wider. Now, let's say I say Biden's going to be between 44% and 52%. I can be like 100% confident in that, but only because the interval is that big. That's not really telling us anything, though, because the interval is too big. And so we have a bit of a trade-off. The bigger we make our interval, the more confident we can become. So you could say range, if that helps with a different thought process about it. But the more confident we become, the wider of possibilities we allow, and therefore the less information we convey. Now, there is a relationship between how confident we are and how wide our range of possibilities is. And we use this through what's called alpha, and I use rho, and here are, def here are our definitions. Alpha is our level of significance. I'll explain that in a moment. Rho is the more intuitive one. This is our level of confidence. This is how confident we are. So if I have an interval for Biden, let's say it's 45% to 51%, I could be very confident in that. And yet that interval also gives us something pretty useful. It's saying Biden's very likely going to lose taxes, but there's a chance he very well might win. And so that's an example of something useful. Now, we have what's called alpha, and the funny thing is the alpha is the one that makes a bit less sense or intuitive sense, and yet is the one that's going to be more useful. What alpha means is this. Here it says level significance, but to put it in English to where it makes much more intuitive sense, alpha is what we assess to be the chances that we're wrong. So for example, let's say that I'm 95% confident that Biden's gonna get somewhere between 45 and 51% of the vote in Texas, then there would be a 5% chance that I'm wrong and he's outside of that interval. Now, on the other hand, let's say I was 20% confident that Biden would get exactly 48% of the vote. If that 20% confidence is correct, that means there's an 80% chance that I'm dead wrong. And so in that sense, the higher, the more confident we are in something, the lower the chance that we're wrong. But this is in terms of math. That, that, that's not a life hack. You don't get to be more confident in your grade and suddenly it goes up. That's, that's not what I'm referring to here. We're referring to our estimates. Now, conversely, you know, sometimes if you go into these board games or video games or whatnot, Oftentimes, just being more confident in yourself, you might do better, you don't get shaky, you don't get nervous, and you don't make the same mistakes. But that's a conversation for a philosophy class. This is a math class, so we're gonna stick with the math. The relationship between these two is that our alpha and our rho, so our level of significance, which is the probability of us screwing up, and rho are how confident we are, they have to be one. As you can clearly see, if we increase one, the other's gotta go down. As we get into chapter nine and chapter 10, we'll give a better definition of alpha, but for now, the one we're going with is alpha is the chance that we've screwed up. So for example, where'd my mouse go? Here's my mouse. Let's say I give the estimate of the true difficulty level of this course as being somewhere between 3.2 and 4.2. And let's say I say that with 90% confidence. In this case, 
our 90% is our row, which means our alpha has to be 10%. So there's a 10% chance I'm wrong in that the difficulty level is outside of this. Now you might ask, where in God's name did these two numbers come from? For now, we're not gonna worry about it. For this lecture, I'll just give you the numbers. But as we get into the next two lectures, you're gonna start computing these numbers and using the formulas to get them. But for now, I think it's more important to explain the concept of them because there's no reason for me to ask you to compute something if you don't even know what you're computing. How can you compute something if you have no idea what you're doing? So concepts first. Now, a few misconceptions involving some of these. Some people might think, oh, alpha and rho, you know, can't their difference be zero? If the sum is one, can't we take one off the other and get zero? The only way that can be the case is if they're both the same thing. And that's a simple mathematical proof, which is in the practice assessment number two. But if alpha is 30% and rho is 70%, their difference is not going to be zero. Their product can't be one because they're both decimals. And there's a lot of different ways you can go around that. But as one example, there are a couple of rearrangements of this formula that you're going to want to use. One rearrangement is that alpha is equal to one minus rho. The other one is that rho is equal to one minus alpha. So that way it puts it explicitly so that if you have one, you can solve for the other. Unless it's one of these three, it's not a correct expression or it's a useless expression. So you should be familiar with how to work with this. Before I continue on to an example, are there any questions about this type of concept? I know it kind of seems a little bit arbitrary, but as we get into the confidence intervals, it'll make sense why I presented it now. So let's go to some examples of just finding alpha and beta. So let me go to the right up here. Here we go. For this one, I'm gonna do part A for you and you'll do B and C. This is a web work problem. However, the catch is this problem once you give the whole interval. For now, we're just gonna get the correct value of alpha. Because to get all these intervals, you're going to have to use the alpha, and usually you're going to start with the row. So for example, this first one, we have 95% confidence, which means our row, in this case, we put it in arrow, our row is 95%. Row plus alpha is one, so alpha would be 5%. So in this case, 5%. So that said, I'll give you maybe 20 to 30 seconds to do B and C, just get the values of alpha. Because for all these problems, that's the first step. You're going to get the whole problem wrong for all of chapter eight, all of chapter nine, all of chapter 10, all of chapter 14. You're going to get everything wrong if you can't get the right value of alpha. So that's why I start now. So go ahead and take just a little bit of time to do B and C. Should take you no longer than maybe 15 seconds. <laughs> Maybe I should count to 15 in Spanish. Does anyone need more time? <laughs> Our first one, 90% confidence, 100%, which is one, minus 90%, we get our alpha is 10%. Our last one, 99%, means we're left with 1% because one minus 99%. Now, concept check. Which one of these parts is going to have the widest interval? How many of y'all think it'll be A, B, and C? It is going to be C. The reason why is in order to be more confident, we got to make that interval bigger. And for example, I could say, I predict that at the end of the semester, the evaluations on effectiveness will be between one and five, and I am 100% confident in that. Sure, but bullshit. <laughs> I mean, of course it's going to be. By definition, I can be 100% confident, doesn't convey a damn thing. On the other hand, if I said I am 40% confident, it's going to be between 4.0 and 4.1. I mean, sure, that's oddly specific. It's very narrow, and I'm not that confident. In it. So therefore, by the converse, which one of these will have the narrowest interval? How many of y'all think A, B, or C? Yes, it'll be B because since we're 90% confident, our interval is not as wide. Now, that said, there we go, it's right there. So let's talk about these intervals. When I said that example of Texas, the sample mean was 
and I was saying it was from 45 to 51. So in that case of Texas, I'll just write it down here. Texas, we had 48%, but then I said 45 to 51. In this case, that's the same as saying 0.48 plus or minus 0 0.03. And this is, th these are the two ways you can write the confidence interval. You can use the bracket notation or you can use plus and minus. Web work will tell you which one to use. The assessment will tell you which one to use. Now, you might ask, why does our sample mean have to be in the middle? Why can't I say 48% to 54% with 90% confidence? Well, no matter what, no matter how big your sample size, no matter how screwed up your sample is, in theory, if you believe your sample is correct, your chances of being below that sample should be every bit as high as being above in terms of sample size. You recall the normal distribution, our peak right in the middle, the further we get away from it, the lower the probability goes. And here's the thing, if we can maintain 90% confidence, but widen our interval, I'm sorry, narrow it, then we should do so. The narrow of an interval we can give, yet with more confidence, the better, and that's maximized by doing it around the middle. Here's the graphical reason why. Here's our normal distribution. We could just cut it off right here and say we're 90% confident it's going to be from negative 1.5 to infinity. That's a pretty wide interval. You could maintain that exact same level of confidence by saying it'll be between negative 1.9 and positive 1.9. Your confidence is the same, but yet you significantly narrowed the interval. And there's a longer mathematical proof of it, but this isn't a proven analysis class. Long story short, for all of your confidence intervals, for all of our just pluses and minuses, it'll always be centered around our sample statistic, whether it's our sample mean, our sample standard deviation, or our sample proportion. In this case, we will usually deal with X bar and P bar. Those are the ones we're most concerned with. Because for an actual presidential election, we don't care what the standard deviation of the votes are, we just care who wins. And so therefore, we're more interested in the actual means themselves. So the two notations for it are X bar plus or minus E, or you can do P bar plus or minus E. Now you might say, what's E? E's our margin of error. And you will, I will teach you how to compute that margin of error in chapter eight. But for now, we'll just pick whatever numbers we want just for the purpose of understanding the concepts. In this case, our margin of error is 3% because it's 48% plus or minus 0.03. So for example, let's say I gave you a, a, some sort of estimate and let's say that estimate of the number of you who likes me, let's make it a nice big fun number, I like that. The number of you who like me is somewhere between 0.8 and 0.9. Just from that, you can figure out the margin of error and p-bar. You don't need a single thing else. You don't have to know how confident I am. You don't have to know what the sample size is. And here's why. Our sample proportion has to be exactly halfway between these two. Halfway between 0.8 and 0.9 will be 0.85. And we went plus or minus 5% on each end. And so just like that, we have our P-bar and our margin of error. You can work backwards from, the mar from that margin of error to figure out all these other things, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to leave that for Chapter 8. And as I already stated, if we have a larger margin of error, by definition, the interval is bigger. And as we discussed, if the interval is bigger, we are more confident. And so therefore, to put this in very mathematical terms, the larger our value of E, the smaller our value of alpha, or if you want to put it the other way, you can say the larger our value of E, the larger our confidence row. Let me just double check I haven't missed anything in chat. No, I'm not. Seems like everything's moving along nicely. So therefore, to give you the very formal formulas, let's suppose we have some interval A to B. Our X bar is the sum of A and B divided by two, or it can be you know, P bar, same thing, doesn't matter. And then therefore, our margin of error E is our mean minus the low value. So in this case, this example I gave, the really formal one, 
our A is 0 0.8, our B is 0 0.9. We divide this by two, 0 0.8 plus 0 0.9 is 1.7. Divide that by two, 0 0.85, which is what we got by eyeballing it. Our margin of error is our P bar, so 0 0.85 minus our low, which is 0 0.8 which is 0 0.05, that's what we got by intuition. This is probably the one unit where it's easier to work backwards than forwards. I don't know from the previous ones, the previous ones it was harder to work backwards, this time it's the exact opposite. Working backwards is easier this time around. So we're gonna start with the easier part and then we'll get to the harder part. So here's a practice one and you can solve this one right now. If you go home, you can solve this with what I've shown you. So here I will zoom in just a little bit so you can see it better. So here you have a confidence interval. I want you to figure out what P bar and our margin of error ER should only take you about 30 seconds. They have a little hat on top of the P, you can use P bar, doesn't matter, same thing. All right, does anyone need more time? Okay, well, We'll start with our P hat. It's kind of hard. If y'all had more than 10 fingers, then I could ask you to hold the number of fingers that you think it is. For those of you in Zoom, you can go ahead and type in what you think the P bar and the E are. For those of you in here, you can take off your shoes if you want and hold up the number of toes and fingers, but I don't think any of you wants to do that. So I'll just go through some numbers. How many of y'all think the P is 15%? 16? 17? 18? 19? And how many of you just don't want to hold your hand? You got some liars here. <laughs> Margin of error E. So yes, that's correct. It's 17%. As a note, you can put in literally 17% into your assessment. For web work, notice these are decimals. You should keep it decimals. So in this case, just to use the full formula, we know that's our A, which is 0 0.15, plus our B, which is 0 0.19. And we divide this by 2. That's 0.34 over 2, 0.17. Then our E is our 0.17 minus our low, which is 0.15, which is 0.02 or 2%. You can go home. After today, you can instantly solve this one. You notice it's two points, by the way. It's an easy one for two points. Wonderful. You're not going to see a lot of these anymore. <laughs> you'll notice the current web work. It has less problems, but you'll notice many of them have multiple parts. And you'll see when you get to the confidence intervals, those can be some more. So it might look like less problems. It's not. <laughs> the length is about the same. Are there any questions about these very general concepts involving confidence intervals? Okay. We are well ahead of schedule right now, which is nice. Let me see what I have left. Yeah, I know I have that. I have that done. I believe we should have a couple of examples left and we're done. All right. So let's go here. I want to give you all an example where you're calculating P bar because you're going to have to do this for, I have to scroll. There we go. I'm sorry. That's what I was missing. Let me zoom out a little bit. I knew something was missing there. So here, I just want you to read the problem and do A and B. Don't actually solve the problem itself. Do A and B. One of these is a reading comprehension. The other one's just some quick math. You know, this is a polling question. You're going to see polling questions pop up on the actual assessment. Important note, P is the population proportion. P bar is our sample proportion. Don't get those mixed up. If you mix those up, you're screwed.
Do any of you need more time? Okay, give you an extra minute. Let's go over the answers. The first one, P is our population proportion. We are assuming it is 52.3%, so that's our P. This is one of the very rare problems where you're given P. Most of the time, you don't get it. For most of the examples that you're gonna see in chapter eight and technically onwards, you're gonna be given P bars and X bars and S's and have to figure out stuff from there. You're very fortunate to start off with this, but I'm starting with the easier ones so we deal with the concepts. Now with this one, we recall that P bar is equal to X over N. This one is just applying that formula, but going backwards. So in this case, we have our P bar, which is 0.499. And this has to be equal to our X value divided by our N, which is 480. So, we just multiply out the 480 onto the 0.499. We get 239.52. You might say, what do we do with a decimal? You can't have 50% of a person. Well, if they're stupid enough, you can, but <laughs> let's not worry about that. In this case with rounding, we will always round up. Now there is a good explanation of why we always round up. I'm gonna leave that for a later lecture, but for now, a rule of thumb, you want to write this down. The rule of thumb is if you're finding a sample size or X value, basically sample sizes or number of people that agree with something, always round up. The only time we wouldn't round up is if this was 239.01, in which case, sure, 239. But generally speaking, you round up, and it's because of uncertainty. By increasing our sample size, we reduce the uncertainty. And so that's why if we, if we have a significant decimal in question, we round up to reduce some of that uncertainty. So in this case, we'd have X be 240. Or if you want, you can say exactly 239.52, but you have to cut someone in half to do that, which I'm sure... There's probably at least one person in our class, whether they're here or not, that might consider doing that. The denominator? For which one? Right, this one right here? This is an N. Oh, this, this one's a 480. 480. There you go. All right. Now, we got one more. Oh, that's actually some content. It's the last bit of content, and then we are done. So we have these intervals, and natural thing is you gotta interpret it. I have specified and emphasized very much so in this class, I'm going to focus at bare minimum every bit as much on interpretation as calculation. Because this was a calculation class, you just pull up a computer and have it do it for you. The computer can't interpret things for you. You have to interpret it for yourself. So here, let's suppose, now, this is supposed to be a P, P bar. There we go. Don't worry about that for now. Let's start with the top one. Let's suppose we have some interval of the number of students in this class who want to go home right now. <laughs> uh, start, start, start something like that. Oh, someone's already leaving. <laughs> you took that too seriously. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> and let, let's suppose that number was 10 people. In this case, our X bar is 10 people. Let's say the true number is somewhere between seven and 13. There is only one correct way to interpret that. In that case, I might say, I am 90% confident that the true number of people who want to leave right now is between seven and 13. That is the only correct way. Everything else is wrong. 
I'm going to give you a few examples of what's wrong, and I'm going to explain why they're wrong. So, so let me, let me write, write out the example here. Let me type it out. Suppose we are 90% confident that between seven and 13 people want to leave class right now. Obviously, in this case, we have X bar is equal to 10. That's the midway point. So the correct way, we are 90% confident that the true number of people who want to leave class right now is between seven and 13. The first one that's wrong, we are 90% confident that the sample mean is 10. That is stupid. We're 100% confident because we just calculated it. If, if you're 95% confident, you're saying there's a 5% chance you don't have to compute sample means, which before you came into class, maybe, hopefully not right now. So that one just makes no sense. The next one that's wrong, we are 95% or 90% confident that the true number of people who want to leave class right now is 10. No, we're 90% we're 90 confident that's between seven and 13. 10 might be in there, but that 90% includes the seven people and the eight people and the nine, the 11, 12, 13. So that one's also wrong. What is also wrong is that 90% of our sample means are between seven and 13 people. That just makes no sense. We don't care about that. We do not care at all about all the sample means. We care about the actual population mean or proportion. The final one, this one will catch people off guard. We are 90% confident that the true percentage of people that want to leave class right now is between seven and 13. The issue with that is not the wording, it's that it doesn't apply. That wording is correct, but not for this example. This example, the X bar is not a percentage. It's an actual integer number. And so therefore we can't use that one. Now let's suppose for this other one, uh, I'll bring back the Texas example, suppose, we are 90% confident that between 45% and 51% of Texans would vote for Biden. Oh, come on. Come on, there we go. So here your P bar is 48%. There's only one correct interpretation, and that interpretation is we are 90% confident that the true proportion of Texans who are going to vote for Biden is between 45 and 51 percent. Anything else is wrong. Here are a few examples of ones that are wrong. The first one, we are 90 percent confident that this one just it's really goofy. It's, it's, it's the same goofy one as before. We are 90 percent confident that the sample mean is 48 percent. No, that's stupid. You're 100 percent confident because you just calculated it. Same logic as with before. The next one, we are 90% confident that the true percentage of Texans that will vote for Biden is 48%. No, you shouldn't have much confidence with that one number to begin with, but our range is where we're 90% confident. The next one is also a goofy one, where 90% of our sample means are between 45 and 51. We don't care about the sample means, we care about the actual population proportion. We do not care about all the sample proportions. We just take our one example and work with it. In the last one, this is the one that it's not technically wrong, it just doesn't apply for this one. We are 90% confident that the true mean is between 45% and 51%. It's not the mean, you want the proportion. So I have an example here, and this one is actually off the practice assessment. So before I continue, does anyone need a clarification here or still need to write stuff down? Yes. Pardon? The true mu. Well, no, this one says, so you're saying the second to last one, so this one right here? This one right here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I drew some arrows because sometimes it can be really hard to differentiate between the rows and the P's. The row is our level of confidence, the P's are 
our true population proportion. So here is an example. I will zoom in. This is off the assessment. I'll give you just a moment to do this one. There are two ways you can approach these types of problems. Find the correct one or throw out the ones that make no sense whatsoever. And what I recommend is that little list of examples of correct ones and incorrect ones, you should write that down. This is going to pop up multiple times on the assessment. All right, does anyone need more time? All right, how many of y'all think that A is the correct answer? B, C, and D. Well, this one we're gonna go two ways. We're first gonna throw out the ones that make no sense, and we're gonna be left with only one more. Then I'll explain why that one makes sense. Let's start with D because that one is the goofiest of the four. We are 99% of the customers buy between 7.3 and 19.7% of the sleeping pills. That just makes no sense whatsoever. It should, that's just nonsense. We're, it doesn't even say we're 99% confident that the customers buy between 7.3 and 9.7. So that just makes no sense. So D is out just by virtue of being nonsense. C is nonsense for the same reason. It says we are 99% confident that 7.3% and 19.7% of the sample biosimum pills, that just makes no sense either. We know what it is. The sample was 13.5%. Both those numbers are wrong. So that one's also out. And now A, we are 99% confident that 13.5 of them percent are on the sleeping pills. That's wrong. That's the sample mean. That is an example of the one up here where it said we are 99% confident that our sample means our sample mean. That's just nonsense. Yes, it is B. <laughs> so, at least with B, why is B correct? Well, this interval is meant to estimate where our actual proportion is. Our correct answer has to have true proportion. Or if we were dealing with X bar, it'd have to say the true mu. So, a true mean. If you don't see that true mean or true proportion, it's pretty much instantly wrong. That's the real shortcut. And part B is just really reading off what we already have here. We know it's between 7.3 and 19.7, and it says it's 99% confidence, so therefore it will be B. There's two ways of going about this. You can just look for the correct one or just throw out all the nonsense ones. There's always going to be at least one of them that is so nonsensical, you shouldn't have to look at your cheat sheet to know it's nonsense. Pick whichever one is better for you. Me personally, I just look for the correct one. However, I have dealt with this for quite a while. There comes a point where if you practice something so much, you're used to it. The way I learned it, and then the way I imagine many of you will learn it, it's easier to throw out the ones that make no sense first. It's kind of like with the uh, in, in unit one, when you had what type of measurement scale is it? Two of those measurement scales applied to categorical. The other two were for quantitative. And the first thing you should have done was figure out which one of those two is it, because that immediately knocks out half the answers. Oftentimes, and you're probably going to get confused on at least one of these because it, it's a lot of words and it's a lot of numbers being thrown at you. If you're able to immediately get the right one, that's great. I would probably recommend knocking out the ones that are the, the ones that make the least amount of sense. Now, let's say you do that and you got two left. And you're like, these both look reasonable to me. You got two options there. Look for the one that seems most reasonable to you or knock out the one that makes no sense. 
no matter what, this one little thing right up here, this little box, this will get you a long way there. If you see an answer choice that doesn't match any of these formats, then you should know that's such a nonsense answer that that is instantly wrong. All right. Uh, so this one, we have two different things. Our first one is rho, like um, I'll, I'll type it out, R-H-O. That's how you spell it, R-H-O, like the Greek letter rho. The first one is rho. Rho is our level of, or how confident we are. And then here, the true P, the P is the population proportion. That is all we have for today. We are done. If you have any questions about any of this material, feel free to say after and ask. A final note, I have moved all of the evening office hours forward by 30 minutes because there are a few people that said they have stuff around 8 p.m. or so. So hopefully that 7.30 to 7.59 part gives you a bit of extra time to work with.